My name is Jan Williams. I was born on the 2nd of February, 1955. Um, I live in Harvey Bay. Um, I grew up here in Paelva. Um, where this building sits is where I played with many of the neighbourhood kids um, from an early age, way back in the early 60s. Um, there weren't as many buildings as there are now. Uh, we played together with other black kids, white kids, the, um, different nationalities. There were Germans and French and Chinese and, and we all had a wonderful, wonderful time playing together and growing up together in this place. Um, it wasn't an issue of what nationality you were. We had to live day by day, came from a rather big family, five children. Um, my mum was a home carer and dad worked at many jobs, so he was away a lot. So um, it was mainly our mum. Our influence came from our mum. Um, our only grandparent that we had during that time, well, that I can remember, um, was my maternal grandfather who lived in Bundaberg, a South Sea Island man, Robert Tanner. Um, so I'd say he'd often come down during our school holidays and, um, and we spent a lot of time with him in Bundaberg as well on school holidays, Christmas time. So I suppose growing up was probably uh, a lot of my cultural upbringing was from a South Sea Island perspective. Um, my sister and I have often spoke about that. She said, well, that's probably what she calls our cultural capital, comes from the South Sea Island side. Um, Dad, my mum, of course, a Tanner woman from Vanuatu, where my grandfather descended from. He was born in Bingra Plantation in Bundaberg. My dad also had a South Sea Island connection too. Um, my paternal grandmother was a full-blood bachelor woman from Gary, Fraser Island, and her name was Mary Gaylor. Now, the Gaylor name is also a South Sea Island name. My great-grandfather, dad's grandfather, was Jack Gaylor from the Solomons, from Gaylor Island in the Solomons and he had married a full-blood bachelor woman, um, Annie Morris, who was born at uh, Wungilba Creek on Gurry. So I suppose, but I didn't know any of that growing up. We just knew that who was our mum, our dad, our granddad, and who our friends were, our neighbours, and who we were culturally, it wasn't... It was never, it, it wasn't a part of our growing up. I went to Paolba School. We walked through the bush to go to school, to the primary school, uh, from grade one to grade seven. Um, I did high school at Harvey Bay High, mixing with the same children I grew up with, um, still not knowing my uh, heritage, either South Sea Island or Butchler. Um, did grade 12 at Harvey Bay High, then joined the Air Force, travelled around Australia before I had children, um, still not knowing anything about my, my cultural background. Um, but I grew up with a, as a young woman, I grew up with a very strong work ethic, which was instilled by seeing my dad doing so many jobs to bring us up, uh, to help help raise us. I, as a 13-year-old, I actually went out, started my first work, picking beans at Riverheads um, on Saturdays and Sundays, and then I would help with uh, the household coffers and hand that money over to mum and dad to help with whatever we needed in the house. But I never, I never thought that I had to... I'm handing stuff over to, it should be money spent on me. 
It was just something that I knew I could do. I could help the family. I did the same thing whilst I was in the Air Force. I would send money back to mum and dad to help to help with household stuff. Um, still, still not knowing anything about who I was, whether I was what nationality we were. We were just black fellows, and that was it. Um, it wasn't until I became a mother myself, I became a mother and dad and mum became grandparents um, in the 70s. Uh, I had my first child in 1975. He's now 42. Um, and then I started to ask dad questions. Mum would talk, we had a very... Christian-based upbringing. My grandfather, Bob Tanner, was very much a Christian man and he would sing gospel songs to us and play his mouth organ and um, my mum was a, was a, was a, wasn't a practising Christian but she was a Christian woman, always read her Bible. I'd never heard mum swear once in her whole life. She died in year 2000 at the age 69. Um, so it was as I got older and became a mother myself and, and that I started to ask Dad questions and um, he started to be forthcoming in those questions. He told us about his schooling. He went to grade five at Takura School outside of, um, on the way to Howard, Tormanley, the Takura School, it's still standing, to grade five. And he said, and that was his first memory of, that was a memory that, that came back to me. He said, I was in grade four. He said, I was the only black kid in the class. And the teacher asked, what's this? And he said, Can, he put his hand up to answer. And he said, that's your binang. And she scolded him because he spoke bachelor language. And in that day, they weren't to speak. He had grown up in a household with his, uh, his great aunt because his mother had died a year after he was born and they weren't to speak language under the white Australia policy. So um, but at home they would have speak about body parts, uh, bidong was your ear, um, different things he had told me, but I, I could never remember them because we, we were never taught them growing up because he wasn't allowed to talk or teach us as well. So, and he even remembered, um, remembered an, a man who was his great uncle, who was the last bachelor clever man, whose name was Wanamata, which is the family group that we descend from on my paternal side from Gary, Fraser Island, the Wanamata clan group. Um, Granddad Tanner never spoke much about South Sea Islander ways or he didn't have any language that he spoke. Um, just had that very gentle way, very caring, gentle way that um, had a wonderful garden, vegetable garden in Bundaberg, grew lots of fruit trees and and trees around his house in South Bundaberg. And uh, we live next, he lived next door to his cousin, who was um, Uncle Ted Miniger and Auntie Ada Miniger. And that was Mel Meninga's grandparents. So my granddad and Uncle Ted were actual cousins um, from the Tanner Island. Um, so we're sort of related uh, that way to Mel. But we didn't know that growing up. We didn't, it was just not, uh, actually I remember Mel and playing with the Meninga kids when we were kids and his cousins from Nambul, the Foresters. And uh, Mel was a bit of a sook. We used to, actually he was a bit of a sook as a, as a, as a young kid. <laughs> but, um, we, yeah, we had this, this richness, this life that we didn't want for anything. We had nothing. We had nothing materialistically. We had nothing. 
But we were happy. We had a, a good life. We had a good life. Um, now I, I look back and I think I became a native title applicant about 20 years ago before we got um, determination on Gari, where they accepted the fact that we were traditional custodians of that land. Um, and so 20 years of, of doing that was, was quite, um, was, it was quite good. It was quite, it was a learning process for me too. I learned lots of things that I had never known from my father um, or from any of our family because they weren't allowed to speak about such things. Um, I think that um, it, it's been a, a really hard time. I realised it growing up, not knowing the people that lived in Urangan. And that seemed like it was in Brisbane because we had no transport. We'd walk to the beach here in Paelba, um, play in the bush here in Paelba. But that was it. We had no interaction with other black families that lived further down like in Urangan. I didn't meet them until we went to high school. <laughs> and uh, they'd lived here their, all their lives as well. But there was, I sort of picked up as I, as I grew and became a mother, a little bit of animosity between the two different mobs, the Aboriginal and the South Sea. Growing up in Pyalba, as I said, it was a very diverse cultural mix black, white, whatever. And then Daddy explained to me, I grew up in Pyalba, it's a street now called Islander Road. Well, I grew up in that street, but it was called Fraser Street. When I grew up, it wasn't much of a street here, it was mostly bush, a bit of an old dirt track. Um, but it was Fraser Street. And it was my dad who pushed council into, Dad, dad took it up and said, well, hang on, this place is very special to South Sea Island people because along that street there were plots of land that belonged to South Sea Island people that were... And I asked Dad, I said, well, how's it, how did that happen? I said, um, well, he said that when, when there were lots of South Sea Islanders working for farmers and landowners that lived in the Pyalba area, and when, when uh, the blackbirding was abolished, I think in the early 31, 30s, early 30s, 1930s, the government said, well, you can go back to your islands, to the South Sea Island people, or you can stay here. And most had been here for quite a few years as from young people. And so they said, well, we want to stay here. So the, the landowners, the farmers said, well, we'll give you a plot of land, which was mostly around that Pyalba area. And so, of course, you could imagine the bachelor saying, well, hang on, that's our land. We're the traditional custodians of this. You know, this is our land. This is where... So how come these South Sea Islanders can own this land? We're given this land and we've got nothing. So... And that sort of animosity was sort of generational from back in Dad's day to even to this day, to my, my children's generation, my grandchildren. There's still that bit of animosity that it's still there. It's, still not, as, it's not bad, it's not violent, there's nothing, but there's, there's in an, um, you often get comments about, you know, South Sea, them Kanakas, them... South Sea mob being noticed, they think they own everything and so, but I, then I asked Dad, I said, well, why is it that the farmers treat the South Sea Island people better? And he said, because they're cultivators, they could grow things, they, could, they, were, they were workers that were used to cultivating, whereas the Aboriginal people, the bachelors or in this area and Aboriginal people in general, were hunter-gatherers, they weren't cultivators, they didn't grow things like the South. So the South Sea people were brought over here, uh, tricked into coming over, and, you know, slipped into slavery. Um, 
So that's why they were treated better because they were workers that the Aboriginal people were looked upon as as lazy, as heathens, as as not being able to do this or that or whatever by the white Australian landowners, um, I don't know, the the government of the day. So so that that sort of stuff sort of carried on through my life. We're in the late sixties, um, I just started high school um, and the Queensland Government had offered um, these new u Butte Housing Commission homes, just a weatherboard, nothing special, but to us it was special, to my mum and dad. So they had the opportunity for, they offered the opportunity for families, black families in Harvey Bay to apply for these homes. So my dad and my mum, we lived in an old house on the corner of Nissen Street and Fraser Street, which is now Islander Road. And my dad's sister, Gladys uh, Robe, and her husband, Tom, they had an old house too, just up the road from us. They applied, there were two families and there were other three families from Urangan who applied for these housing commission homes, uh, these new u Butte homes to be built by the government. And of course, um, the ones who got the homes built were my dad and my auntie. Of course, there's that South Sea thing again. Of course, they get the homes. But it was just that the government had decided that out of the five families that had applied, my auntie and her husband and my dad and my mum were the lucky recipients, recipients of, the, of the new homes that were built um, so that was another thing that sort of added another more fuel to the fire of, um, of uh, the dislike of the South Sea Island people. But um, there has been a lot of intermarriage um, all throughout Queensland, let alone here. Um, so I, I proudly say now, like now I can say, well, listen, I can wear two hats. I can wear a South Sea Island hat and I proudly wear a bachelor, an Aboriginal hat too. And I'm a mum of seven children I had, um, a nana of 33 and a great nana of four. So, um, and I have kids, grandkids that are as white as white and some that are as black as black. But I love that and that's the cultural diversity that's a part of Australia today and that's what I believe is uh, we have a very rich country and we come from a very rich, I think our background, my background from my family, I said my children, my own children have Punjabi, Chinese, Tongan, um, English, uh, French and that's just my children, my grandchildren have many, many other mixtures and that cultural diversity is just a great, I love it, I just love it. Um, oh gosh, uh, I've worked in many jobs apart from joining the Air Force at a young age where I uh, did a lot of pen work, I was a pay clerk, I ended up um, at, my last posting was to Amberley before I got out and uh, got married and had my kids, I worked many years in the public service, uh, tax office, Telstra, uh, Social Security. I scrubbed floors at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. <laughs> I scrubbed floors and made ice creams at Peter's Ice Creams in uh, West End in Brisbane as a job to keep, uh, keep my family. Um, I'm not frightened, I was never frightened to get my hands dirty. Um, I preferred um, doing stuff rather than sit behind a desk and be a data processor for the tax office in uh, Telstra. But uh, I enjoyed the talking to people jobs that I had with the CES and Social Security where I was a contact person. And then at the uni, USQ as an Indigenous Support Officer 
and I now do stuff, just casual work for uh, University of the Sunshine Coast. And I think that it comes back to that work ethic that was instilled to me by my um, my dad. Yeah, well, my dad. Yeah, he, as I said, he went to grade five at Takura School, and that was his schooling. Zip. He. He was quite intelligent. He. Um, I don't know what you would call it. I. I, I look at it in a way. Like our descendant, Wanamata, was a clever man from the bachelor side, from the Aboriginal side. Wanamata, he was a clever man. He was the one who um, would uh, give advice. And well, my dad more or less did that role as well, in a in a um, in a more modern world. Um, dad was a community worker, a Corowinga community worker for Corowinga, uh, which is an Aboriginal organisation. Dad was a community worker for many years. He was a justice of the peace for 25 years. He would uh, sign legal forms for his friends who were farmers that he grew up with and they trusted Dad to any legal stuff they would bring to his house. And these are white Germans, uh, uh, German farmers and English farmers that would come and get Dad to notarise their legal papers for them because they trusted they could show him that stuff and he would um, he'd be kept just with Dad. So we had lots of, um, yeah, yeah, I just thought about that myself. And um, he, as I said, he worked, his work ethic was so strong. He was a driver in the war, Second World War uh, he drove trucks up around Winton. He did, I don't know. Yeah, well, it was for he said he remembered her seeing prisoners of war. So I don't know what he meant by that. Um, must have been a camp somewhere out in the west somewhere. He was a truck driver and did lots of driving. Um, he picked fruit in Victoria. He'd go down for the fruit season and do that. Uh, he taught and did a lot of po tree poisoning, taunting trees all around South East Queensland. Um, yeah, he picked pineapples and cut cane here in Pi Alba. Um, I'd often go with him um, on weekends while he topped the cane and burnt the cane and I would go with the farmer's wife. Um, uh, they owned all the land down where the hospital is. But the hospital is now, they still have their, they still own land, they're the Pantler family. And um, there used to be lots of cane there. So Dad would be cutting cane and we'd go catching lobbies over in the paddock beside him. Uh, <laughs> so he could see us uh, go lobbying and we get some, we call them lobbies, I think they call them crayfish, yeah, fresh water. And we'd go and get the gawalvas and Dad would often take us camping um, when he'd have weekends off from, uh, he worked on the railway for many years. He'd come, he'd be away all week and come home on weekends. He'd take us down, we'd walk from Pialba through the golf club down to Eli Creek and camp and get crabs and the shellfish um, and all along the beach from Pialba and Point Vernon we'd do Often do night trips and have uh, back beach at Dundarren, have night camps with Dad, just him and us, the kids and Dad. Yeah, Mum would never join us. Mum was a real homebody, a homebody. She was, uh, uh, she'd do the cooking and cleaning. And I remember living in, in uh, Fraser Street, named after wonderful Captain Fraser. Um, Mum used to, we used to have a Sunday dinner. It was a special day, Sunday. And uh, we didn't have a fridge or anything in those days. There was no electricity. So uh, we had uh, kerosene lights, wood stove. And to iron our clothes, Mum would have to put the iron on the wood stove to heat it up. Um, and she'd make us jelly. And... Um, 
I was always fascinated by the way she made jelly and custard. She would, we had a no laid on water and she'd put the jelly and custard under the tank stand where it was really cool and she'd sit it under there and it would set with the coldness of the, of the tank. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was something that, and we had like, in those days, you only had chicken at Christmas time. You know, we had chooks. I cried to cry when Dad used to have to kill the chooks at Christmas time because we'd fed them all year, and then that is, you know, Dad'd have to kill them. Dad would kill them at Christmas time. I never could never watch. It was then throw them into hot water, into a boiling tub of hot water, uh, the copper, the copper, and. Um, feather the chooks. But that was a special time, Christmas time. We had watermelons, soft drink, and chickens, yeah. And um, when I became a mother for the first time, that was 42 years ago, I had him at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, the Royal Women's. Um, we had nothing. My husband and I, my husband worked for Evans Deacon Shipyards, Kangaroo Point, and uh, we were pretty well strapped. And my mum had offered, I can never forget, my mum had offered to buy the bassinet for him, but she had bought it, but she hadn't been able to bring it down to Brisbane from Harvey Bay. So my first child, my son, slept in an apple box for the first week of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and we lived in New Farm, and uh, he had this apple box that I, yes, yeah, I remember that, gosh. Um, but that was my proudest moment, was becoming a mother. I had six more children after that, but um, yes, yes. Hmm. I've lost my two brothers, my my. My youngest brother died when he was 29, uh, 28 years ago. Um, he had uh, a heart complaint, uh, so he died suddenly. It was quite a shock. I was living in Brisbane. My second brother I lost just November last year. He had esophageal cancer. I nursed him for three years. He was a bachelor. Um, Another person with a really strong work ethic. He had worked all of his life. His last job was 35 years with Wide Bay Water and Council here in the Bay. Um, he'd worked previously with Mount Isa Mines and played football up around Mount Isa in North Queensland. Um, and my sister, Denise, she was, she's a teacher. She's been teaching in Alice Springs for uh, 30 years. She's one of the first uh, Indigenous uh, students that uh, became teachers through James Cook University back in the uh, late 70s. Um, and my younger sister, Lisa, she's uh, an aged care worker in the Territory as well, um, in Catherine. Um, yeah. yeah, but they all seemed to want to come back to, they always, they always did. My, my brother working away, wanted to come back home. I was living in Brisbane for a while, wanted to come back home. This was always home. This was always a place that we wanted to. My sister is uh, retiring from Alice Springs, working in Alice and looking at properties back home here and her husband's a midwife at the Alice Springs Hospital. Um, I like socialising at school from a very young age. Um, I remember starting in grade one. <clears throat> in grade one, um, I was scared as my brother and I had, uh, had recently, as youngsters, before I started grade one, had to get our tonsils out at the Mirabar Base Hospital. So we had to both be in a hospital at the same time and get our tonsils out. He was a year, two years older than me. Um, 
But once I'd started grade one, we had this wonderful Indonesian teacher who lived up the road from us. And, uh, and all the kids, and another old lady, Nana Baikwa, who, um, an old South Sea lady, who was everybody's Nana, black kids, white kids, and she lived on the way to school, to the primary school, so we'd have to walk past her house every school day. And uh, she'd always uh, call us in or have something special for us, you know, afternoon tea, uh, even if it was just a mandarin or an orange that she'd gotten off the tree. Um, but it, like growing up, I, I met a, um, an old school friend of mine, Julie Gibbs. She's the curator of the Gimby Gallery for council at Gimpy and um, she remembers us starting school together and her father worked on the railway with my dad and they lived at Point Vernon and um, and and we were having a good old laugh the other other week about um, having to I was always faster than her in our sports days and she said we were the only two because we were the same age and we were younger than the other kids and she said, I always remember you used to always beat me at everything <laughs> in our sports days. And we just had a good, she was a little, I was a black girl with fuzzy hair and she was a little white girl with freckles and red hair and she still looks the same today. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had a good life growing up, going to school. I loved it. Um, I loved sports days. I loved... Uh, we had an old uh, music teacher, Miss Dre, uh, Miss Dre, who would teach us singing and we learned sewing and I liked those primary school days. Um, high school was much the same. I enjoyed that. I hated maths. Um, I loved English. I, it was one of my favourite subjects. And I did grade 12 English and I did quite well in my grade 12 English. And I, I had joined the Air Force after I finished grade 12 and I was at Wagga Wagga. I was sent there after my rookies in Adelaide and I saw this man walking up the promenade in, in Wagga Wagga at the Air Force base and, and I saluted him because he was an officer and he said, hello, Jan. And I looked at him. I didn't really look at him first. I, I said, oh, my God, you know who he was? He was my English teacher from grade 12 here at Harvey Bay High, he had joined the Air Force as an officer and became an education officer at uh, Wagga Wagga. And so we became, well, I spent a lot of time around him and his wife because she was my netball coach here at Harvey Bay High. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that was, uh, that was a really good time. That was a really good time after leaving school in those early years of Travelling around Australia, um, I saw my. I went to most states and did all that travelling before I had children and became, I suppose, housebound and um, child, yeah, childbound, yeah. But um, yeah, Mum always encouraged us to to achieve and to. She always said. Uh, do your best. It might not, not, not be as much as somebody your, your friend can do. It might be able to do different things to you, but we all have something that uh, we're good at. And um, I've always kept that in mind, that um, I'll always have something that I can give. Um, yeah, yeah, something that I can give to everybody, to anybody, yeah. My mum was, she was a teacher, um, but it was never, um, it was never, I never appreciated that I don't think enough until I had become a mother myself. And I think back, I think, oh, mum, you did tell me that. Oh, mum, yes, yes, you were right, mum. Yeah, um, I never appreciated it until I became a mum myself how much, how special she was to me, how much she meant to me and how important she was 
in my growing up. Um, Mum was an asthmatic. Back in the days, in the 60s, treatment for asthma wasn't very good, wasn't much. So because Dad worked away, and Mum, a very bad asthmatic, she'd often have to go to hospital and spend time at Harvey Bar Hospital. So my brother and I, who were the oldest, would have to look after the other three younger ones and um, by ourselves in the house in Pialba. But we had friends and neighbours who would come and help and, and cook meals for us and, um, yeah. But uh, Mum would then come out of hospital and pick up her role again and, um, yeah, like she was always there, always there. And she was the same with my children. Uh, they remember her fondly and my oldest daughter, um, she... She spent a lot of time with my mum and dad, so they were, and that was something that um, I knew that when I went to Brisbane and to work, she stayed here with my mum and dad, and um, it was it was uh, my mum had contracted cancer, um, breast cancer, and so it was. It was something to have my children around her was a was a healing thing for her as well to help her to cope with what she was going through. Um, she uh, suffered with cancer for a long time, but uh, she never complained. She never complained. She was everybody's. Uh, she was grand to everybody: black kids, white kids, uh, <laughs> to. Uh, Lots of neighbourhood kids. She was grand, yeah. But that was that was her. Yeah. I lost my second son in February this year. Uh, I still don't have a cause of death for him. But um, yeah, he was forty, forty-one. Um, my oldest daughter. I live with her. Um, Delise, she's a wonderful artist. Um, she's a carer for kids as well, her sister's children. Um, my next, my other daughter lives in Brisbane. Um, she, she has one daughter and she's a grandmother. So um, she has two of my great grannies. Uh, down in Brisbane. Um, my other three children live here in the Bay. My son, um, he's 28. He's the, he's the youngest of my children. Uh, my two daughters in the middle, uh, 33 and 34. They both live here in the Bay too. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, so I I have I'm surrounded by grandchildren here in the bay, but they they are scattered from Bundaberg down to Brisbane and Stradbroke Island where I have granddaughters, um, and Tweed Heads where I have granddaughters, uh, grand two granddaughters, but um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm never lonely. As a mum, as a mother, um, I'm divorced. So I think I have carried on that role as the as the teacher, as a nurturer of my family, and that goes to my grandchildren and my great grandchildren now. Um, I have. I, I would hope that they they have a life that's, that's um, I suppose socially things are very different from when I grew up. Um, I, I have a joke now, I say to my friends, oh, school holidays, I live with four grandchildren and uh, I said to them, you only went back to school five minutes ago, you know, how come you have so many holidays? And I said, I wish I had so many holidays 
when I was going to school, but I probably didn't. I um, um, and they said to me, well, Nana, that was back in the old days. But I said, we went outside and we played in the bush. We built cubby houses. We got our hands dirty. I said, all you kids want to do these days is to sit with your iPods and your iPads and your iPhones and your laptops and your computers. You don't know what it's like to get your hands dirty. And I said, I, often say, I still say to them to this day, um, I don't believe that, I know change has got to happen. It, I have to accept the fact that things have changed over the years and they'll change even more as my great-grandchildren grow up. So it's just to instil in them the fact that they have to be proud of who they are and where they've come from and to make the effort to be a good person. Be a good person. Think about other people, not just yourself. Um, because in this day and age, there's too many people that think about themselves and think about materialistic things, which aren't important. I, I like to say to the kids that it's not important. The main thing is that I like, I like my children, my, grand, my grandchildren, my children are all grown up and parents themselves. I'd like to see my grandchildren be happy, be happy, be happy that they live in a, a free world, that we live in a free country, that they don't have to put up with the terrible things that other children do in war-torn places and do not have to um, worry about having a meal or having somewhere to put your head down and, and safe at night and... Yeah, all those sorts of things, I suppose, is important to me. Hmm. Yeah.